On the 12th of May, 1926, the airship Norga passed over the North Pole. This transpolar flight, led by Roald Amundsen, Umberto Nobile and Lincoln Elthworth, was the first verified trip ever to the North Pole. They had begun their last part of their journey in New Olesund, a small mining town on Svalbard, just the day before. Svalbard is an archipelago in the Arctic Ocean, halfway between mainland Norway and the North Pole. This made it an ideal last stop and a gateway to the high Arctic and the North Pole. Nowadays, New Olesund is a small international village where 11 nations operate their research stations. Svalbard and Jolson have also been a gateway to the Arctic for me. In 2014, I became the station leader of the French-German Arctic research base up there. And I fell completely in love with the Arctic. Life up there is very much connected with nature and the immediate environment. I would spend as much time outdoors as I could. There are beautiful mountains several calving glaciers terminating in the fjord and icebergs floating around. I would never get tired of that stunning scenery. The change of the seasons from midnight sun to permanent darkness in winter, where you can watch polar lights at pretty much any time of the day. And even if that environment seems harsh and cold, it is yet so abundant with life. There is the tundra with mushrooms and flowers and lush green fields of moss. A fjord so rich in marine life from phytoplankton to whales to polar bears and birds everywhere. But what got me most up there was that community. Life in Jolesund is, is like the world in small, even though Nations don't really matter and there are no borders, but there is great cooperation between the different institutions and researchers from different nationalities. It's a lived utopia. So when I left Svalbard, I was properly hit by the Arctic fever. I was drawn back to the Arctic, to that beautiful landscape, the adventure, but also that communal spirit. In 2018, I started a new position as the logistics coordinator of the Mosaic Expedition, the biggest Arctic Ocean science expedition up to today. See, the Arctic is the epicenter of global warming. The temperature there is rising faster than on any other place on the planet. But due to permanent darkness in winter, thick sea ice and cold temperatures, is the Central Arctic is very hard to reach and is a challenging environment to work in. So we actually have very little measurement data from that area, especially in winter. The German research icebreaker Polarstern would spend an entire year trapped in the ice, drifting with the frozen Arctic Ocean. We would set up a research camp next to the ship on the sea ice to measure parameters of the atmosphere the sea ice and the ocean. Hundreds of researchers of over 80 institutions and 20 countries would take part in this expedition. They would take measurement data and across multiple disciplines, they would all work together to get a set of data as complete as possible to gain more insight, which is key to understand global climate change. To cover the duration of one year. The expedition was taken into five different cruise legs. While Polarstern would stay in the ice, researchers and crew would be exchanged with supply vessels and planes. So when I had my first meeting with the expedition leader, we were supposed to have dinner. I know, I also ate something that evening. But what I mostly remember is that even before ordering any food, I ended up with more than two pages of notes, and in the end, a long list of things to organize. From table flags for fancy evenings, to a safety policy for work on the ice, 
how to deal with polar bears and how to build a runway on the ice for planes to land. I mean, I am a planner. I like to think ahead and I like lists. I really do. But how to plan, how to pack for 100 people for one year in the Arctic Ocean, how to meet the needs of all those different teams and projects. I was completely overwhelmed. Luckily, I was not alone. We were a big team, and together we could bring a great deal of experience to the table. So in the year and a half to come, we developed that safety concept for work on the sea ice and in the darkness, and also some very basic things, but equally important, like a toilet policy. Because otherwise somebody would literally piss on somebody else's later measurements. We tested clothing to find the best solutions for frozen and cold temperatures way below minus 30 degrees in winter and plus degrees wet slushy conditions in summer. Still. Until the very end, until the day of leaving port, I had sleepless nights. I feared that I forget something crucial. When I pack for my summer vacation and I forget my toothbrush, well, that's bad for me, but it's not the end of the world. If I would have forgotten that one item to make that expedition work, that was my nightmare. I certainly did forget some things, just to be clear. <laughs> but we made it work anyway. Either somebody else had that one piece, or we may arrange it differently. And also very often conditions were so different than expected that we anyway had to get creative. At some point one has to work with what's on site and have a great team spirit where everybody is getting a hand. So after three and a half months up there, the supply vessel appeared at the horizon. And it was time for us to hand our camp over to the next team. I hope that all our preparations were good enough and that the new team would understand our instructions and markings and find everything. When we left the flow, I was very tired and relieved. I could just let go, I had to just let go, and trust that things would work out. The camp was set up, Polarstian would continue to drift and the new team would continue to gather data. And then the global COVID-19 pandemic put everything on hold. We were prepared for all sorts of scenarios. A flow breakup, too little ice, too much ice. Medical evacuations or a supply vessel not coming through to Polastian. But nobody had foreseen a pandemic. We had made plan A, plan B, plan C. But it was as if we were in the middle of a game and suddenly somebody had changed all the rules. Airports were closed, international travel was partly impossible, and there were no ships available. How to continue an expedition with participants from all over the world? It took us weeks and many, many meetings. And at points it seemed as if the only solution would be to end the expedition and bring those people home. But it worked. In the end, it was neither plan A, B, C, or D, but a new improvised solution. I do believe that that was based on the good preparation we had. We had years of experience in polar research and were well connected. So if we wouldn't have bothered to make plan A, B, C, D, we would have never come up with plan C. In June 2020, the exchange that was planned for April finally happened. I went back on board for the last five months of the expedition, and on the 17th of August, we passed the North Pole. When I think back of Mosaic, of course I think of the beauty of the Arctic. I also remember the challenges we've had. Leads opening in the middle of the research camp, darkness, cold, fog, snowstorms, polar bears, of cold feet, frozen fingers, and long days. But mostly, I remember the people. All that community 
that we had up there, that great team spirit that made it all work. Even though there were hundreds of disciplines across nations, but we all worked together, we had a common goal. I'm proud to have been part of this, to have been part of something bigger. This expedition could not have been done by one nation or one institute or one person. To understand global climate change, we need to work together. It cannot be done, it must be done, across nations and across disciplines. I was just one piece of the puzzle, and together we made a bigger picture.